All right. Okay. So hopefully this is now working. I'm with Kath Bishop, who I was just thinking, I think it's nearly two years since I saw you up in Darwin for cake and coffee, which is delicious. Um, and yes, but so much has happened for you since then. So, yeah. Um, maybe. Uh. I don't know. Hang on. Let me maybe check and see on another. <laughs> Technology is not our friend today. I don't understand why. Uh, yeah. Have you, do you need to press another button? Oh, no, here we go. Okay, you're coming. Now. Yes. There we no. go. <laughs> All right. Now we're I'm here. here. <laughs> Oh my lord! Um, yes. Oh, and you've got your poster behind you. Of course. That's very good promo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you at home or are you back in your office? Um. Oh no, I don't have an office. I just I work from home normally. So this is like no different. Like this is where I work. This is oh. you know. I mean, why why would you go into an office when you can live in the Blue Mountains and work from home? I know. It does. It does sound magic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, for anyone who doesn't know Kath, this is Kath Bishop, and uh, you've got a DECRA at the moment, which is one of the big grants that the Australian government gives out to very lucky and very lucky amazing researchers um, for anyone who's listening from overseas. So, um, like you said, it is a bit of a lottery and, and I don't Social know. lottery, I think. Yeah. But, yeah. Yes. But, um, but I'm so thrilled for you that you got it and that you're able to continue on with your work. Um, so there's a few different projects that I think we're going to talk about today. But do you want to start by talking about Annie Locke, who you know so well, even though she's no longer around? Yes. Um, um, so, yeah. Well, Annie Locke, I first found her um, when I was a master's student, which was about 150 years ago, <laughs> and, um, and I wrote a master's thesis on her. And basically, I only wrote a master's thesis on her because I was supposed to be doing another project. I was supposed to be um, investigating race relations in Udna Dada, which is in the middle of South Australia and miles from anywhere. And that was the topic that my, my then supervisor at ANU, when I arrived from New Zealand, said, you could go and look at race relations in Udna Dada. So I went off to the archives. And the reason that nobody had actually written about it was there wasn't an awful lot of archival material there. So, um, but I did find these letters from Annie Locke, who was this mad missionary woman who was being really bolshy. And I thought, oh, maybe... And at, you know, 21, I thought, oh, she's a feminist. She's so cool. Turns out she's the most conservative woman in the world. But <laughs> she does actually get out there and jump up and down about things. So that's kind of appealing. And um, and so I wrote this thesis about her, and then she's been haunting me for the last 150 years. And now I've written a biography of her, which I'm currently touting around publishers. Yeah. And, um, and she's just, she's just, like she sounds really unappealing in some ways because you know she takes children away from their parents and she does all of this you know she her letters are very you know oh the dear poor dear natives you know it's really it's really missionary language is just delightful sometimes but at the same time she's at least jumping up and down for people that often get just dismissed and she does she does she's up in the northern territory when there's a a massacre of Aboriginal people, the Coniston Massacre, which is, of course, one of about five massacres that actually even Keith Windshuttle acknowledged happened. Um, and she's one of the people who blows the whistle on it and makes sure there's an inquiry. So yeah. she does some good stuff too. Like she does, and she, you see, you talk to people about her and her colleagues all found her impossible to work with, but um, <laughs> because she liked doing things her own way. But some of the Indigenous people that I spoke to, they had quite positive things to say about her. I mean, not entirely, but, you know, she did seem to actually care, which kind of, you know. So, yeah, she's a complicated person to write about. I was just going to say, people <laughs> are so complicated and it's once you start scratching the surface, it's so hard to pigeonhole people into, like, one Good, bad, or, yes. Or, 
Yes. So I was going to ask why she needs a biography, but I think that <laughs> the complexity and all that stuff. So what time was she, like what dates was she around and operating? So she was early 20th century. So she started being a missionary in 1903 when she was about 26. Um, and she retired in 1937. Um, so that was when she was 60. Um, and in between, so she worked for 35 years. Now, most missionaries, they go to one mission station and they stay there. Um, and she didn't. And um, she traveled around. So she started off in New South Wales. She And then she goes to Western Australia, where she works down south and then way up north. And then she goes to Udnadatta, um, which is how I found her. And then after that, she goes up to the Central Australia, which is where the massacre is. And she ends her time, um, her last mission station is at, at Uldia, which is on the, the line that goes from Adelaide to Perth in the middle of nowhere. And she lived across the sand hills there from Daisy Bates for a couple of years. Oh, really? um, they hated each other. Oh. Um, but um, I, think, I think Daisy thought she was kind of jumping her claim, really, you know, taking her Aboriginal people. So... So that wasn't so good, but um, but yeah, she so she worked during a time when when children they were starting to get much more formalised policies about removing children. They were just and um, there was no kind of concerted. It was all a bit ad hoc. But at the same time, she's deeply implicated in all of that, um, and it's fascinating because she changes. So at the start of her career, she's quite okay about it. Um, even up to 1929, I think I've got a letter from her saying, you know, the only thing we to, to, to do is just to get the kids right away from their parents. But at the same time, a few years later, she's in 1937, 1936, she's writing to the chief protector going, no, don't take these kids away. They, right. They're better off here. Don't take them to the city and put them in a home. So she's obviously changing too, which is good. <laughs> but, you know, but, um, but, yeah, so she's, yeah, she's good because, she travels around because she travels around so much. And of course, the reason she does that is because every time they send someone to help her at a mission station, they start to fight because Annie wants to do things one way and everyone else has another way of doing them. And she's not very happy about that. So oh my goodness. But, yeah. did, um, I've got two questions from that. So one is, did her response to child removal depend on who was in the role as chief protector of, like, was it the ah. relationships with them? No, I don't but think so. Was it more just the principle of? I think, I think she wanted to she wanted to save children, so she had this vision for what Aboriginal people could and should and would do and it wasn't terribly ambitious i mean she certainly didn't imagine that indigenous people would be politicians or lawyers or doctors she saw them as domestic servants and rural laborers she wanted them to be useful but she also wanted to give the and she of course as an even evangelical christian she thought that that was the answer to everything so she thought that that would provide them with a, a framework in which to cope um it gets more complicated than that because of course she saw um and did what she called full blood indigenous people, particularly up in the Northern Territory. She very much was of the group that that felt that they should be left to work out their own salvation. You know that they that really they needed to be well, apart from the fact that they should all be converted to Christianity, of course. Um, that, but they should they should do so without interference from broader white society. And then so called half castes, she wanted to sort of improve. You know, bring them up to our high way of living. She thought. In so, in the so, um, so it, it she had this idea and but so it depended on where she were and who she was thinking about and also how the mothers were looking after their children so if she saw nice clean camps and nice clean children then she would think that the aboriginal women were doing a good job of mothering so therefore they should be left you know okay. but it's it's all it's all sort of all of her judgments are very um culturally determined in a way um but also she's at the same time at the same time she condones aboriginal men beating their wives at one point which is a whole different issue and yeah it's really interesting because she gets she she brings up all these kind of questions that you think are really obvious and simple and then you start digging and you realize actually it's much more complicated than your first thing. You can't divide the world into good and evil and and everyone is much more 
much more complicit in evil and much more much better sometimes than you think they are so it's yeah it's complicated yeah. Yes, my favourite history teacher at school used to say, nothing's black and white, it's always a shade of grey. Yep. And yeah. That, that's but it's not, even, it's not even a shade of grey, though, because there are times when Annie is downright bloody evil. Yeah. Like, she really, like, I really I hate her. And then there's other times when I just admire her guts and her courage and, and she does good things. So she's kind of, she's not only grey, she's good, and she's bad, and she's sometimes good and bad at the same time. So, so how do you, how do you <laughs> your own feelings about her when you're writing? Do you try and be objective, or have you just kind of given up on that? Um, I think it's been very strange because I first I first wrote a manuscript for this book about before I did my PhD, so about 10, 10 years ago or something, and I wrote this manuscript and I sent it off. And I was so busy trying to justify, not justify, make, make, find reasons and explain that it came across as being an apologist for her. Yeah. So it came across as I was trying to get inside her head too much and I came out as a sort of, it was like hagiography. Thank God the publisher didn't publish it really. <laughs> because it's much, it's, it's much more interesting actually to think about, well, how do I feel about her? How would other people feel about her? And and where does she sit? Because you can't you can't just sit here and you know twenty twenty and go, oh she was terribly evil because she was taking children away from their parents. It, it it's it that's it that's too um, that's too simple. You can't. Life is not like that. So basically, I've tried to rather than ignoring the fact that she's complicated and that she promotes strong feelings, I've tried to bring that out. So explain, you know why I think like that and when I'm thinking she's actually good. So acknowledging when she's actually doing something good, but also acknowledging when she's doing something that either today or then we wouldn't think was that fabulous. Yeah, yeah. You know, because, I mean, today, if you, it's like even at her most when she was doing the best thing that you can think, which is when she was blowing the whistle on a massacre, even when she's doing that, her whole life up in Central Australia, you, if you look at it from one perspective, yes, she's doing a good thing and she's she's gone up there because she went up to Central Australia when they were in the middle of a drought, which itself has been much debated, and she didn't have the support of the Missionary Society. She's a faith missionary anyway, so she doesn't actually get any funding. She has to pray to God for, to provide, and she ends up, setting herself up on this water hole in the middle of nowhere and attracting sick and ill Aboriginal people to her. Now, on the one hand, that's really good because she's providing a service, except, of course, she didn't have the skills to nurse them. She didn't actually have the food to feed them. And from the point of view of some other people around in the area at the time, she was actually making the situation worse. So, but then you read some of the opinions of those other people and you think, okay, so, yeah, Maybe they weren't the best either. Um, it's just so problematic. I watched I watched Sweet Country the other the other day, which is the film that's done by Warwick Thornton, and it's about Willaberta Jack, who Annie Locke met. You know, he was that he was an Aboriginal man who shot a white man in self defence, and it was really interesting watching that movie because it it took me into the. It made me realise that you can you can pitch things one way or the other. But it wasn't a very pretty picture of Central Australia and the Northern Territory. Um, it did show the really negative side of it, um, and I think there are there are areas of of contention with it. But it really, yes, it made me realise that yes, maybe a missionary or the, like the Sam Neill character in the film, who is, you know, who actually eats food with Aboriginal people in his house at his table and not a lot of people did that mm. but some did and they didn't yeah but anyway sorry that was a long waffly answer <laughs> oh, wow. maybe i haven't seen that one yet um i was going to ask which denomination she was oh. because, was it the um yeah you said faith mission but is there it was the united what's what then became the united aborigines mission 
So it's a non-denominational faith mission. She herself was a Wesleyan Methodist. And what's funny about that is whenever she has to fill in forms about the children who are on her mission station, they're all Wesleyans or Methodists. Mm. She's kind of claiming them from the church. It's hilarious. Um, but, yeah, so she's she's basically a Methodist, Wesleyan Methodist, um, but ultimately a, a sort of evangelical Christian, not very well educated, quite a simplistic understanding of what, you know, Jesus loves me and that's it sort of thing. Um you know, so but the fish, the mission itself was non-denominational. They tended to attract people who were not terrifically well educated. So those people who were nurses or teachers or had more education would often get sent overseas by other missionary societies. Okay. So, but at the time she she joined the mission in 1903, working with Aboriginal people was not cool, even for a missionary. It was kind of your last choice. Yeah. So. Um, Yes, even she, I think even she thought that. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, yeah, a lot of people are quite happy to go to India or Fiji. If they're Much in more the, glamorous, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And like the jewel of the mission enterprise yes. for the Methodists anyway. Yes. So, um, yes. Well, not so much India, but definitely Fiji. Um, so I was going to ask you to kind of talked a little bit about the challenges of writing about a white woman missionary, but did you have anything else you wanted to say about that? Well, the whole, I mean, it's also about being a white woman writing about a white woman missionary. Um, and, and you can tie yourself up in complete knots about it. I mean, I think you have to be aware of it. But then if you get too far down that track, then you wouldn't do anything at all. Because, um, you know, as a, as a female, a white female historian who's grown up in New Zealand and now lives in Australia, does that mean I'm only qualified to write about white female historians who've growing up in New Zealand, you know. So, I mean, um, you, but you do have to be aware of, of your own cultural baggage. And I think that's that's the interesting thing. Um, and what, But what's even weirder is writing about her as a 20-something-year-old 20, 20 in 1990 and writing about her now are mm -hmm. completely different. That would be and it's, it's, I look at my thesis and it's great for the time and it's fine, but there's some things like, I never talk about which group. I never talk about country. I never talk about, um, you know, the Walpuri people or, or the, um, you know, I talk about Noongar, but I don't, I don't break it down. I talk about Bardi briefly, but generally I just refer to them in the thesis as Aboriginal people. Wow. And because she just referred to them as, you know, natives. She didn't really talk about who they were. And actually going back now and trying to find out and trying to unpack that and trying to actually find out who they were is actually quite interesting. Right. Um, and it takes gives it a whole new layer. Yes, I think that's it's interesting thinking about how much the disciplines change or how much we've been able to change the discipline and how we practice our writing. Um, it's also highly political, of course, too. Yes. And it's a very politicised space and it's scary as hell. I mean, I've been writing about, you know, 19th century businesswomen who are all dead and all white and really it's a story of recovery and and aren't they all doing well, you know, I mean, in a simplistic way. But there's not, not a lot of politics going on there, um, whereas this is like it's a minefield. I mean, I figure, you know, there will be people who read my book who hate it. I've just got to not piss people off enough to get it pulped, that's all. You know, it's got to be interesting after all, you know, if you yeah. don't have an opinion, there's no point. Well, yeah, that's it. And I think, um, yeah, these are some of the questions that we all have to ask ourselves as we come into research and scholarship and, you know, the the pros and cons, you know, what might we step into? Um, are we prepared to go there? And, yeah, exactly. All right, next question. What sources did you use? Ah, yes. Okay, so sources for Annie Locke. Um, she wrote a lot of letters to government officials, so there's all of those, and they're scattered in archives throughout Australia. I mean, that, as a master's student, that was the really nice thing because the university paid for me to see Australia on a budget, like it was backpacking, but, you know, <laughs> it was quite good. Yeah. Um, so there's those, and then the mission had their own magazine that they, they produced every month. So there's the mission reports, which are, of course, fairly standardised and they all say that, you know, they're all of a, they're kind of formula right? but you can get, you can pull things out of that. Um, the mission society themselves do have archives, except 
And I, in 1990 and again in 2007, got to see some, which any other missionary historians who are trying to work on the UAM will be going, oh, my God, really, you saw them? Because they um, are in a bit of abeyance at the moment and it's very difficult to get access to them, partly because it's a highly politicised space and partly because of person power and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I saw a few of those, although the archives that I saw there um, were not very well sorted. So there was one point at which I actually found these sheets of paper in the middle of a box on late 20th century New South Wales, I found a, a sheaf of handwritten papers that looked like Annie Locke's writing. And it was all about her and it was like a memoir. And I knew that she'd been public, she'd been writing a memoir in 1937 when she retired, but then it completely vanished, completely vanished. So I think I found a few pages, <gasps> but it vanished. So of course the memoir will now surface the moment I've published the book. Um, <laughs> I did also, and also in 1990, I wrote to every single Locke family in South Australia because I knew she'd come from South Australia. So everyone in the phone book that was, had a surname Locke, I sent a, you know, a, a letter. And this is like snail mail, you know, not internet, not email. And I found her family. Oh so I found her nieces and nephews and I took a little trip to Riverton as a 20-year-old and went and, and met all these people who are now sadly no longer with us. Um, and, um, yeah, and they told me some stories about it. But, you know, she'd been traveling. They didn't really know her very well. There's a real paucity of, of personal sources. It's quite hard to get under her skin. Um, and when you talk to, I've I managed to find some interviews with Indigenous people. Um, I've talked to a couple, um, but a lot of that, you know, these are these are people whose parents were looked after by Annie, or who, um, you know, who were very small children when they remember her. So they have a particular memory of her, usually of a motherly figure, yeah. you know. Um, but, you know, if you, I'm sure if I had talked to some adults at the time she was around, they may have had a different story. Yeah. You know, they may not have appreciated her quite as much as the children seem to have done at times. So, so yeah, sources are difficult. But, yeah. but you thought outside the box, which is always good. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. being so dedicated, sending out snail mail to track people down. Ah, yes. Was yes. that part of an ethics board now? Um, oh, there was no ethics then. <laughs> uh, different times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was no ethics then at all. And what? But the other thing that's very interesting about the whole ethics thing is that I was, so in between my PhD and, and the DECRA, I didn't really have a job. Like I had occasional bits and pieces, but I was never a, really attached to a university. I was attached to ACU for a short while. But the time that I was working on this project, Annie Locke, I couldn't get ethics oh. because no university, the universities will only give ethics approval to academics who are working for them. Yeah. And so if you're not at a university, you don't have ethics. So it makes it really hard because, you know, I did go and interview people occasionally if I happen to be in the place but because I wasn't working for a university I didn't have ethics approval but I made my I made sure that I had the forms that I had created I mean they're not backed up by any university but you try and do things as ethically as possible yes but yeah. it's imp it's very difficult if you're not I mean on, on the arguably it's easier if you're not at a university because you don't have to go through the hoops but having gone through the hoops for a couple of projects I think it is actually a worthwhile process if a little tedious at times. Yes. No, I think that's right. Actually, that's a whole other discussion we could probably cover at another time. It's like how do you transfer that um, ethics-based practice to yes. being like a public historian or do, would, do you feel more like a journalist or something like this? I don't know. Um, still a writer. But, yeah, it's blurred, isn't it? Um, Very. And there'll be a lot of us who are in that boat now because all the ah, specials are yes. flat. So, ah, yes. So what do we yes. have to do? <laughs> I know. I, I realise I'm not alone. It's actually been quite a shock coming back to, because I'm only part, I'm doing the DECRA part-time for the oh. first couple of years because of all these other projects that I've got on. Yeah. And um, it's actually quite a shock to come back into the university fold and the bureaucracy, which is delightful. Yes. But it's nice to have a salary too. So, you know, I'm not I'm yeah. not complaining. Yeah. 
Um, did you want to say anything more about the length of the project? You've said some interesting stuff about comparing when you wrote the original version, so to speak. And then um, well, I wouldn't recommend waiting <clears throat> more than, well, 30 bloody years it'll be. 30 <laughs> years. You do not want a project that lasts 30 years because the bad thing about that is that all that historiography that you did way back in 1990 is no longer blimmin' relevant now. You know, <laughs> everything, there's been so much written. I mean, when I did my master's thesis, I think Pat Grimshaw, yeah. Zai Langmore had done stuff on female missionaries. Yeah. Nobody had done anything on female missionaries working in Australia. Right. Nobody had done anything, very little on Australian missionaries apart from those two. It was like, and very little even elsewhere. So it was like, I was at the cutting edge. That was my moment and yeah. I missed it by a few decades because now the whole field has exploded. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the stuff, I'm just thinking of Claire McCleskey's work. Oh, and, yeah. I it's mean, the, Grim, the Grimshaw, the Melbourne Grimshaw yeah. School of, yeah. of missionary historians, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a apart, actually. So, uh, yeah, bless, bless that. I love her so much. Yeah. Um, and did you want to say anything more about turning the thesis into a book? Is that yeah. a difficult process? Um, I guess I, I didn't really, in a way, because it was so long in between. So I first revisited it about 15 years after. So I've had a few a few goes at it. Um, and so, yeah, you have to write in a completely different way. Ironically, actually, I think going and doing the PhD on a completely different topic and then doing those books has really helped me learn how to write the Annie Locke book. I don't think I, I didn't, it wasn't, when I read what I wrote before I did the PhD, it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> at, one at one time, I did try and turn her into a novel. Oh. And... Um, Yes, that was, I'm not a novelist, you know. I can't have her sort of looking at sunsets and things. It just doesn't work. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I tried it and my mother, I sent it I sent it to my mother who told me that something along the lines of, um, yes, that sounds a bit like Mills and Boone, dear, go back to doing <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, yeah. I, it's very hard to be a novelist writer out of yourself once you've got into that I think yes, yes. Um, did you have any other tips for anyone who is trying to convert their thesis into a book um publishers don't like footnotes mostly um and um it's about it's about making sure you cut the jargon out you know and and just like mm -hmm. that's if you want well don't know hang hang on dial back if you want to write a book that you're going to sell in Australia to a popular audience, to a regular audience, then that all applies. You know, cut the footnotes, um, write accessibly, you know, be a bit creative, be funny, be something. Um, but if you just want a book that's going to get you a job in a university, you don't need to worry about that because you just go to an academic publisher. And the most, a more overseas publisher and the more expensive the book turns out to be, the better job you'll get out of it. Yes. That's Do I sound a bit cynical? Um. <laughs> it's just, it frustrates the hell out of me how, how people who, even, even if you're publishing with a university press here in Australia, people still think that if you go to Cambridge or Harvard or somewhere overseas, it's going to be better. Yeah. And I just, and then you end up with books that cost a lot of money and are less accessible. Yes. Yes, that's right. Over a hundred dollars for yes. a hundred and twenty yes. page book or something. Yes. I guess the way I solved that one with my PhD was I wrote academic articles and put the academic and academic stuff into the articles and then I wrote the book. Uh, which was so you satisfied to Yeah. Rewards. Yeah. That's a that's a good strategy. Yeah. I but think, then I had time because I had no job and I wasn't teaching. So therefore if you don't have if you don't if you're not teaching, you have time to write. Yeah. I'm the producer. You know. <laughs> oh, like I said to you, you're living the dream a little bit at the moment. Oh, I am. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been a wild coming, but it's it's good. Yeah, it's worth the wait. Yes. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on was your collaborations and interdisciplinary work. Um, and you wanted to talk about collegiality in that too, I think. Oh, yes. 
Yes. And please so it applies to the Annie project, and I, I mean, because I have just I have just done this edited collection on something completely different on nineteenth century female entrepreneurs a global phenomenon. And I got together with a colleague in Britain because we realized that we'd both written on businesswomen in 19th century elves. You know, I'd done New Zealand and Australia and she'd done England. And then we realized people in America had done it. And then we thought, well, has anyone else? And we managed to get a group of about 20 scholars. I think we've got 19 or 20 chapters. Wow. All about, and we got together. It was so cool. We managed to get everyone to get their chapters in before the workshop we had in March last, April last year in Northumbria at Northumbria University and we got almost everybody in the room or they Skyped in and we had the most amazing two days because we had all of the people who wrote the chapters plus we had about three PhD students from England who were doing stuff plus we had a few hangers-on who we'd met at conferences who were kind of interested and everybody I I was a bit I was a bit bossy because I sent around all the chapters. I said, right, okay, we're going to distribute the chapters. Everyone has to read three because you're going to be asked to comment. And so I made everyone read at least three chapters. And they did. They actually read them. They not only wrote them on time, they then read them. And then we had this most amazing discussion. And it was like, it was like we just, I think everyone was really invigorated by it because we were all sort of experts in our own field in our own countries. But by talking to people from, like, we had people who were working on um, on Brazil and um, Angola and Canada, and I even had, I have, oh, we had the most, the best PhD student. He's actually working on pirates in the, in the South China Seas. And we were, we were looking for someone to write on China, and we couldn't find anyone. And someone put us onto this guy who admitted that he'd never done gender history before. What should I read? He said. So we said, Oh well, you know. <laughs> and he produced the most brilliant chapter on Chinese female pirates and Chinese women's engagement in the business of piracy. And it was just perfect. If you're doing an edited collection, you always need PhD students because they produce work on time and they do what they're told. <laughs> and they make an effort. Not that everyone else didn't either. It was a really great project. Now we're just waiting for the publishers to sort their act together because we've had a wee problem with the index, but we won't go there because that was last week's nightmare. Um, <laughs> but the, the whole thing about, about collaborating internationally means that you get to see what's special about your country and what's not. You get to see where the differences are, and that makes you ask different sorts of questions. So it it, it made me think about religion much more because I realised that some of the Catholic countries were operating differently. It made us think about the influence of law because different places have different legal structures and that affects how women could do business. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the Annie Locke project, of course, I got in touch with museum people and, and anthropologists and and I suddenly, after 30 years of working on Annie, I hadn't really thought about artifacts, about oh. material culture. And there was this chance email from someone in WA who was asking me, oh, did Annie collect anything? And I'm going, oh, I don't know, really. And then I started looking. And there's stuff that she collected. And she sold them to museums. And it's a whole different angle. And I would never have even thought about that if I hadn't got onto this these people who are not historians, but, you know, so, yeah. Yes, awesome. I, just, I just think it's wonderful to talk to people who have different different approaches. Yes. It makes you think about things in a different way, and that's always exciting. Yes. Have you read anything from the um, anthropology of Christianity in that kind of field? No. <laughs> I think you would enjoy it. I'll send you some stuff. Please. Yes. 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 Um. Yes, and there's a um, Dario who I've worked, oh, well, I've met at different Pacific History conferences. He's been um, writing up on my Facebook wall about this as well. So Excellent. I think yeah, there's more discussions to be had. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> so we've gone over time, so okay. I should close it off. But thank you so much, Kath. It's been so nice talking to you. And what an interesting project. And I really think, Mission archives are the most interesting because they love a gossip and they get involved in things they shouldn't and they're quite open about a lot of things. Yes. It depends on which mission. 
yeah. I met some lovely people who were really good and they shared a lot of stuff with me and they were really helpful and and they have not put up any barriers at all. The right. only barrier is that when I went back, tried to go back to look at the archives, they were in storage and nobody could access them. Right. Now, the whys and wherefores of that, I have no idea. I understand that something is happening at the moment, but I'm not quite sure what. So right. hopefully the archives will be open for people to see soon and available and accessible. Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, I mean, some of the stuff that you touched on about changes to um access uh are going to be they just haven't applied to mission archives yet and so you can go digging around find all sorts of stuff and then if you don't know the politics then you're likely to really screw up yes yeah (laughs) but um, wait wait till my book comes out it'll be lawsuit after lawsuit (laughs) and you know but you know, I think, yeah, like you said, if you're, if you're, so have you got ethics now for this project, retrospective kind of? Or? Well, I, no, because it's not to do with my decra, okay. and okay. I'm only part time, and the book, all the research was done before, so yeah. I don't quite. I mean, so I have behaved ethically. I'm not. I'm not screwing people over. I'm trying not to. You know, I've got, and I've made sure that. So, for example, in South Australia you have to send what you've written to the archives and they will tell you whether you can publish or not. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So the, I've done all of that with all the archival stuff. 99.9% of the stuff I've got is archival yeah. or it's interview material that has been done by other people and then has been lodged in archives. So that means that all of that stuff is... Public access. It's fine, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's all publicly accessible. It's not like I've kind of... You know, but it is it is very it's an interesting space because when you've done most of the research before and then you're publishing now, mm. there are issues about that. And um and so I've had to be quite careful about about that. So yeah. and I have been, like, you know, especially in this space. This yeah. is not nineteenth century milliners and dressmakers. No, no. no. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Well, thank you so much again. And, um, yeah, look forward to continuing some of these discussions because you've raised a whole range of really interesting issues. Excellent. Yeah, thanks, Kath. Bye. Bye.